Welcome to the Mind of Miz podcast. I'm your host, Ms. Rivera. How do we experience joy? And do we really trust God? Those are the two questions that we're going to be dealing with on this podcast. So if you've ever wondered, you know, if you ever heard us talk on this program and talk about, you know, you have to have joy during suffering, joy in the Lord, and you're like, well, how do we even do that? Well, we attempt at trying to give you an answer for that. Um, and, and then we, we kind of try to exhort to help you out a little bit and think about how are we really trusting God? Are we taking the example that Christ gave to us? And are we living that out in our, in our own lives? And all of this is taken from Job chapter five, verses uh, 19 to 27. Um, it's part of our Job series. And so we, we hope that you're going to be excited to listen to that. And we're going to go through Hebrews 10 and 11. So interesting things that we've got going on, got about an hour uh, for you guys. So if this is something that's really interesting for you, I would say just stick around. And remember, if you enjoy uh, what we got going on here, please go to mindofmiz.com forward slash subscribe and make sure that you subscribe. We have two options there for you. Uh, you'll be a trusted partner with us. You can see everything about that there. Or you can just subscribe at no cost uh, to you. And so we would like to see you on the other side of that so we can get you all the information that you want. Other than that, enjoy the program. Thanks. Welcome to the Mind of Ms. Podcast. I'm your host, Ms. Rivera. Hope everyone is doing well out there. Today, we are going to be looking at the end of chapter five in the book of Job. And we've got uh, some exciting things going on there. We'll get that. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, if you're watching us live and you haven't subscribed yet, please go to mindofmiz.com um, forward slash subscribe. And um, you can go ahead and please do that. Uh, that's really going to help us out with uh, a lot of the things that we have going on. Plus, we can uh, email you all the information that you need. Uh, all right, let's leave that there. Today, we're going to look at chapter five. I have a lot of notes uh, in front of me today. And um, part of the problem that I'm having with this particular study is that I want to I want to do everything right. Um, I, I want to talk about everything that I that I've learned and and, and I've been praying about this and meditating on this and looking at this um, and, and and dealing with with life right. We still have to deal with that. We still have to we have to work. We have to uh, deal with the ups and downs of, of the day and. Um, so there's, there's a lot that I've been trying to wrap my head around. And uh, what I've decided to do is try to give you all a, a, a proper view, kind of an aerial view, uh, if, if we were to say this, um, about, uh, from the end of the book of Job here, uh, excuse me, the end of the chapter five here in the book of Job, uh, which it's technically verses 19 through 27 that we're going to read here in just a second. Uh, we're going to give you an overview of that. Okay, so we'll just go verse by verse um, and go through that. And then we want to answer two questions. And, and this is where the bulk of, of everything is going to be in. And the questions are, how do we experience joy? That's the first question. And then the second question is, do we, do we really trust God? Do we really trust him? Okay, as Christians. Now, if you're not a believer and you're watching this out of curiosity, the Lord has brought you here by um, his providence, there, there's some great things for you here as well. Um, but there is also a lot here for, for the believer, the Christian that's here who wants to um, learn something in this study. And, and those are two questions that jump out from us at the text. And they're not only questions that jump out at us, they're also questions that have been asked of me. You know, people have asked me, how is it do we ex how do we experience joy? Because often, you know, we, we go to the Bible and we talk about suffering and the book of Job. That's all we've been talking about. And, you know, then we're told, you know, be patient and, and have joy. And, and in chapter five, we, you know, we hear things like, blessed is the man. Um, you know, we see that in, in verse 17, behold, how happy is the man who God was like happy, joy. What are we talking about? How do you get that? How do you how do you experience it? And so I really thought about that a lot. And, and I, I think I have some 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 
idea um, that I can share here with you that might help you with that. And then, of course, the other question is more of a um, ex- a question of exhortation. And who am I, right, to 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 exhort anyone? But the Word of God does that for us. And so I I, I want to lay out before you what's on my heart with that question. Um, with in both of these questions, you know, the do we believe in God? Is it, it, they rise from the text that we're reading? Okay, and as as I read this to you now. I will try to point out to you where these questions are being raised up, okay? Um, the joy one I kind of already showed you there in verse 17, we're still dealing with that. Why are we dealing with it? Well, because on the technicality, verses 17 to 27 kind of all go together, all right? And we we split it into verses 17, 18, and 19 because there was so much there that we wanted to cover, and so we we split it. But we're not going to keep splitting these texts because, you know, we'll never finish here. Um so go to your Bible with me, um, Job chapter 5, verse 19. We did read verse 19 last week, but it's important to just uh, begin there, and then we'll end at verse 27. From six troubles, he will deliver you. Even in seven, evil will not touch you. In famine, he will redeem you from death. And in war, from the power of the sword. You will be hidden from the scourge of the tongue, and you will not be afraid of violence when it comes. You will laugh at violence and famine, and you will not be afraid of wild beasts, for you will be in league with the stones of the field, and the beast of the field will be at peace with you. You will know that your tent is secure, for you will visit your abode and fear no loss. You will know also that your descendants will be many and your offspring as the grass of the earth. You will come to the grave in full vigor like the stacking of grain in its season. Behold this, we have investigated it. And so it is. Hear it and know for yourself. We thank the Lord for the reading of this word. Father, we just pray that your word goes forth and that Christ is glorified in this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's take a, a quick glance here at these verses um, and, and just kind of give an, an overview of, of what you're looking at. Look at, again, verse 19, from six troubles, he will deliver you. Even in seven, evil will not touch you. Now, the idea here, um, and there are several ways that people look at this, but the idea, the main idea here at least, is that these six troubles are, are really a picture of what life looks like meaning today you have some issues at work guess what's going to happen tomorrow at work you're probably gonna have more issues um you have some issues in the family guess what's probably going to happen if not tomorrow next week next month you're going to have some issues with the family um your car breaks down guess what's going to happen your, your car's probably going to break down again in the future again. And it's this idea, right, of constant, constant struggle, okay? And we talked about last week, how do we find meaning in that? We find meaning by accepting it, by understanding um, that God uses these things, okay? Um, and so one of the things that we can add to that is seeing, and we'll, we'll talk about this in our question, I think, about how do we experience joy is, the demonstration of God's love in pain and suffering and all the things that happen around us, okay? Um, well, you might say, well, how is that God demonstrating his, his love? Well, he's withholding his mercy, his wrath, excuse me. So he's showing mercy and he's showing, you know, his grace, his graciousness. And instead of, you know, lavishing us with wrath, you can say it that way, he withholds his wrath and shows his love by letting just suffer just a little. I told you guys last week how God is so strong and so powerful, so almighty, that all he has to do is, you know, lay a finger on us and we're undone. In fact, God is so powerful, he can just say the word. And it happens. And so his restraint in our suffering is a demonstration of his love. Now, it's, it's easy to say that, right? 
oh, that sounds nice. That sounds, you know, philosophical in, in to some people maybe. And but then you you know you go live in real life and and the pain in the flesh and the body, in your in your emotions and your mind is real. It's as real as it gets. And so we have to understand then how do we experience joy? That's why we want to answer that question. Because we're being told clearly in verse 19 here, you're going to have troubles. Not one of them, six. You know, maybe on Sundays, you know, trouble will take a day off. Maybe you have one day a week to, you know, be able to, to relax or something like that. But other than that, suffering will be a perpetual part of your life. Okay. Um, and we'll look at that here in a minute. So that, that's verse 19 in a nutshell. Okay. And then we got verse 20 in famine. He will redeem you from death. And, and let's keep reading here. And in war from the power of the sword. But you have two things here that are interesting. You have famine and you have war. Now, I, I don't have the time to go into what this meant to the ancient man. Because, again, I'm trying to answer these two questions. Maybe we'll do an extended Bible studies. Those go out to our uh, trusted partners. And so that might be something that we might um, go out there and set out for you guys. Because there, there is a lot to learn um, in, in, in those details, to be honest. Um, you know, famine, for example, if you just do a quick Google search, right? Do a quick Google search of famines in the 1800s, okay? Just, that's what, 100 odd, you know, 200 years ago or whatever that is. So not that long ago, when, when the world was still, you know, it was, it, was, it was modern compared to, you know, 2,000 years ago. And the way that the famines just ravished and ravished people. And then, and then look at famines up all the way till today, and you'll have an understanding. Um, but famines in, in back in the day, in the ancient days, and I'll just give you this brief kind of history, was a lot more local, okay, and a lot more severe. Um, you know, they didn't have refrigerators. They didn't, they didn't have preservation uh, like we do today. You know, you can, you can have, you know, three-year-old macaroni and cheese, I think, and be okay. You know, you can buy a can of tuna and, and ha have it around for two years, a can of beans for five years or something like that. Um, so you can, we have, by the grace of God, so many ways to preserve that. You know, we hear famine and we're just, we think that's something from, from the old days. And, and to some extent it is, but it was real. Okay. And so what we find here, war, in the end of verse 20, verse 21, you will be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. This is the accusers, the revilers, right? Uh, people that, 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 that bring false witness against you in order to, to bring you down. You know, we're not talking here about gossip. We're talking about life and death here. These are all issues that are of life and death. And, you know, think about famine. That'll kill you. A war will kill you. The sword will kill you. And then the scourge of the tongue is there. And James talks about the tongue being like a fire. And so it's a warning as well in this verse of, of keeping your tongue. And so we have so much there. And you will not be afraid of violence when it comes. And so there's, um, there's a weird shift here. If, if, you find, if you look at this with me, um, in verse 20, you have God redeeming you from death and in war, right? He's redeeming you from war, from, from famine. And, and keeping you from all that. But then in verse 21, it kind of, things start to change a little bit. Eliphaz's tone starts to change a little bit. You will be hidden from the scourge of the tongue, right? Hidden. The word hidden there is different than, than redeemed. And then you have, and you will not be afraid. All of a sudden, now you're fearless. And so you have this fearlessness about you, right? When the violence comes. Why? Because you can stand, if, if you're a true believer, in Christ, and you have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, you can be like those martyrs who knew that they were about to be beheaded or burned at the stake, and they would stand there. There's stories of this. If you haven't ever read the Book of Martyrs, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, you should, you should pick it up and, and read that. It's, a, it's just a fascinating read to see how, how God really, um, you know, empowered people and gave them this fearlessness uh, in order to face death. Um, for for the sake of Christ, and, and so there's this 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 idea of not being afraid of violence. So it's not just protect, it's not just keeping you from something. It's it's hiding you and, and giving you this courageousness 
to be able to walk in, 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 in faith. I mean, there's, there's a reason why Jesus tells his disciples, pick up your cross and follow me. And that cross, we understand it. It's not a cross that you crafted. It's not a cross that you kind of, uh, you know, shaped it the way you wanted it and made it nice and light or made it of a particular wood that you liked and stained it yourself. No, it's it's the cross that is given to you. And, 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 and Jesus' cross was given to him and he carried it and, and, and we're given our cross by God himself in order to carry it through life. And, and we're going to suffer upon that cross and we're going to die upon that cross. And, and, and the idea here is so dark in some ways, but a lot of Job is, right? But we have to find the light where it's given to us and it's what we're going to try to do. But here we are seeing a reality about life that we will die in a world that is a world that suffers or a world that's full of pain. It's the same reason why a lot of people are atheists and don't want to believe in God, but it's because they haven't understood how do we experience the joy in Christ and how is it that we really trust in God? Because we're trying to constantly hang on to the things of the world. And so what we see here is that the only person that cannot be afraid of the violence that is hidden from the scourge of the tongue, that is protected and nestled in the Lord is the righteous man. It's the man who believes. We can go through a score of verses where we can show you where the, the wicked does not have this in his life. There's a verse, I can't remember exactly where it is now. If I come across it, I'll, I'll share it with you. <laughs> but where it talks about that, and I think it's in Proverbs, where you know the man is, or it might not be in Proverbs, but if I find that, I'll, I'll give it to you. But where men run away at the rustling of the leaves, you know, it. They're, they're jumping all the time. If, if you go on the internet or if you see, if you talk to anybody that watches the news too much, you know, they're afraid of what's going on. If people are scared of world wars and all of these things that, that are being talked about and they have no hope. They don't want no, nothing too bad to happen. Not, not, not because, you know, maybe they love this world so much, but it's the only thing that they got to hang on to. But the believer has more than that to hang on to. We have the hope in Christ. And so this is the di one of the major differences. I can't say it's the only difference, but it's one of the major differences between us as the believer and the unbeliever. But often, do we experience joy in the suffering? And do we trust God truthfully? You know, we talked last week that God is the one that brings the rain, right? But do we often trust God to allow it to rain? I feel like sometimes we talk about these things, but we sit back and we just wonder, eh, will God really do it? We pray and we sit back and say, eh, I don't know if God really is going to come through. And so there, there's a, a lack of confidence, of trust, of confiding in the Lord and who he is. And, and, and the majesty of who God is. So we're trying to get you to think about that. Look at verse 23. For you will be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field will be at peace with you. The word league there is talking about a, a contract. Um, it, it, I think this is metaphorical language because um, un unless here there's a reference by life as to um, what, we, what we would call the, the kind of idyllic life, right? Being in heaven. Um, and if, if you can think to your childhood, maybe if you were raised a Christian, I remember seeing books, um, as a kid of, of, you know, these images that were crafted of heaven where the trees looked perfect and, and, you know, you were like cuddling with a lion and, um, you know, this idea, this idyllic lifestyle, there may be something like that, um, that a life is, is doing here. Um, uh, but certainly what, what he is doing as well in, in the thought of the agricultural world, let's say. Um, that they lived in, where they lived, um, you know, hand to mouth, I guess you can say. If, if they came across a field and it was full of stones, that was a worthless field, you know, or they had to sit there and take all the stones and the rocks out in order to be able to cultivate the land. And so there's an idea of that here, but here it says, hey, you're going to have a contract with the stones. The stones just won't be there. They'll just kind of dissipate. And so it's this idea. Um, and I think part of what's happening here is that a life is, is kind of getting excited, right? And as he's getting excited, you know, he, he's saying, hey, there's not no violence. And he's going to keep you from war and from famine. 
And he and now he starts, you know, kind of pushing the envelope here. And, and but he's trying to bring some comfort to Job, but he's he's pushing the envelope because then he says, and hey, you want to be afraid of of wild beasts. You know, the wild beasts there um is this idea of of those you know animals that that come in and eat your domesticated animals. Okay. Um and and animals that that people didn't have the type of shelters that we have today. Today we have big cities and um you know sprawling towns that that kind of drive a lot of the the animals away but you know for them it was a very real thing it could be right outside your tent you know it was a different kind of world that they lived in and so so there's some of that idea in here as well and then he says and you will know that your tent is secure but you will visit your abode and fear no loss well you know again here's the you know a life is getting carried away to some extent and not realizing that Job is looking at him like, well, you're not, you know, I lost my, you know, my kids lost their house. I lost my family. You know, I don't have anything, right? I, I can't afford it. I, so what are you talking about here? Okay. So, so there, there's an irony that is, that I think is, is, I don't know if it's sec. it's hard, you know, it's hard to know whether it's a sec, it's meant to be secondary or, or first. Because there's so much truth that is shared here um, by a life is that often when I look at it, I'm wondering, you know, wh- wh- which one of these do we look first? And I don't I don't have an answer for that yet. Um, I, wa- I want to say that it's a secondary point. And what I mean by that is that. We we have the ability to read the entire book of Job, right? We know what's at the end so we can kind of really dig into it. And so I think a lot of the applications that are meant for us um, are not always just the applications that are within the book of Job. And what I mean by that is that we want to study the book of Job to understand the characters and understand what was happening at that time, right? But there's a lot of things that, that we're not going to be able to, to understand completely because we, didn't, we're not, we don't think like they do. And so we have to then apply the rest of Scripture um, to that. And so I think for us, that, that comes first, um, we don't always do that first here in in our studies because, um, we, you know, we're doing so many lessons that we have an ability to kind of go in and out and really kind of try to show you both sides with this. So, but but I wanted to hit the the joy, and I, I got to do that here in a minute here, the joy and the confidence part because I think that's important for us as believers to really understand what that means. And so, okay. Well, look at verse 24, uh, 25 here. It says, you will know also that your descendants will be many, okay, and your offspring as the grass of the earth. Well, again, in some ways, Eliphaz is kind of being prophetic here, but he doesn't really mean to be prophetic, okay? Um, again, he's gotten carried away. He's talking about, you know, your descendants will be many, but we know that all Job's children are dead. And so, again, this goes back to, you know, when we're, when we're trying to help someone. And we're trying to, I've given bad advice, you know, I, I've, you know, there's things that I've said to people um, that I, you know, I, I, it's just so boneheaded thing that I said, and I thought I was helping them. Um, and it turned out that I just, I wasn't, it was just the wrong thing to say at that moment. And so there's a lot of lessons in, in, in all the speeches of Joe's friends here for us to learn these things. And so hopefully we can do that um, as well. So, you, you, then we have verse 26, which is, again, it's another, you know, <laughs> saying that a life is a saying here in his speech. He's getting, getting carried away. He's saying, you will come to the grave in full vigor. But they're looking, remember, in chapter, was it chapter 2, um, where we talked about, they were basically looking at a dead man walking. They, remember, they mourned, they, they ripped, they acted like he was dead. Because they thought he's dying. And all of a sudden here, he's saying, well, you're going to come to the grave in full vigor. Like, you're going to live your full life. <laughs> and you look at this, you're like, wait a minute. That doesn't, that doesn't seem, the case. It seem to be the case with, with Job. And so that's, that's part of that irony that, that's here. And then like the stacking of grain in its season. This is important. This is a deeper point that, again, you know, we, we, we can spend some time on. Um. Because this, this is really an idea, verse 26, of a, of a life fully lived, okay? A life fully lived. Uh, meaning that whether you die young or old, you, you live the life that God had for you to live. And often we know people, and, and this is a sad situation, that 
die young or die tragically, let's say, um, through an accident or they die through sickness or something like that. And there's kind of like this bitterness in their death. Even, even if they've gone to be with the Lord, you know, we believe that there's some, there's a bitterness because we know and they didn't really live their life out for the Lord. And that should remind us to, to live our life for God. You know, Edwards talked about in, you know, in his resolutions, he talked about, you know, reaching death. And when he reached death, you know, being able to, to say, I've lived a good life. And, and he resolved within himself to live the kind of life that at the end of life, okay, you can actually say that. Well, you know, when we look at our life, if we're dying today, can we say, yeah, I I've, have had a great run in the Lord. And if not, then how do we do that? How do, how do we find, you know, the ways to actually live that life? And, and again, the question of how do we experience joy is part of that. And verse 27 here, behold this, we have investigated it, and so it is. Hear it and know for yourself. Um, and this is really a life of saying, hey, this is the wisdom of the day. This is what we've got to offer you. And Job, you should really hear it out. You should really, really listen to this. It's really important. Um, well, again, there's, there's two questions that emerge from all of this. Let's, let's try to tackle the first one. How do we experience joy? Well, the best way that I could describe to you, to, or at least begin to describe to you this, is I want you to think of, of your actions, okay, your deeds, and your experiences, the things that happen to you. So those are, I want you to track those two things in your mind. You got your actions, things that you do, and, and those are all the things that you do, okay? And you wake up in the morning, you, you, you eat breakfast, right? You, you meet friends, you go to work, whatever it is that you do, however your day works out. All your actions, you go to church, you know, good or bad, okay? All your actions, okay, and your experiences are like little seeds, okay? Um, that later on, you're going to reap from. You know, you have a, a farmer. Right? If a farmer has, has a seed, you know, he can eat the seed or he can plant the seed, right? It would be smart for him to plant the seed. And so if you're a farmer and you have a bunch of seeds, then what are you going to do with them? What actions are you going to take? And our actions and our experiences are a form of that. Okay, I'm, let me explain that further. Go to Isaiah chapter 3. Uh, verse 10, okay? Say to the righteous, the righteous here is the believer, that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. That's interesting, isn't it? You will eat the fruit of your actions. And so we know from the word of God that actions are rewarded in heaven. We get a reward. We, we can, our, how do we experience joy? Remember, this is what we're talking about. How do you experience joy? Well, part of it is to remind yourself that every action that I have and every experience that I go through, meaning all the suffering, the pain, the things that I go through, are all like seeds that I'm putting in the ground. And when I'm in heaven, I'll get my bountiful harvest. I'll get a reward. Now. It's interesting because when the Bible talks about this, it talks about having a reward in heaven. It never tells us that heaven is our reward. And so there's, there's a real thought here that we have to try to walk through because when you're thinking about joy and, I, and I'm attaching it to actions, I don't want you to think to yourself, well, so are we, are we working our way to salvation? No, but there's an interesting part in Scripture. Just go with me to the book of Hebrews that we can go through real quick. Um, I don't know about quick, but we can go through. Um, to, to see the importance, the value that's given to, to human action, okay? 
Um, because one of the things that we don't want to do as believers is, is say, well, it, God is sovereign and that's it. I just, you know, whatever happens, happen. You become kind of the cynical, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, you know, and everything is just negative in that sense. And so you don't really strive to live your life for God. Well, joy is not found in, you know, eating the seed now and getting whatever joy you can in the moment. It, it's in knowing that I am going to get a harvest. I'm going to get a reward. It's not that it's going to get you into heaven. It's that God himself wants you to enjoy this life, knowing that our end result is our end hope is heaven. And that even once we're there, those actions that you did, even then, they will not be in vain. The good things that you do for God, the life that you live for God, is not a life that's in vain just because we believe that when God saves you, he saves you, he secures you in his hand. And then you live in 80 years and things go up and down and you're wondering, man, you know, it, everything has a purpose. And that, and knowing that, accepting that, that it has a purpose and a meaning, okay? That in heaven, God himself will acknowledge what you've done. Even though it didn't get you to heaven, it didn't earn you a spot, but still, that knowledge is part of how God encourages us as believers. And I think we have to see this because, you know, we know that Christ does away with any idea of salvation by works, Look at Hebrews chapter 10, for example, verse 8 and 9. Um, it says, after saying above sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Okay? Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. And then the commentary that, that, that the writer of Hebrews says here, he says, he, Christ, takes away the first in order to establish the second. Okay, and so this whole, you know, kind of workspace system that was just representative of what Christ was going to do was was in some ways misinterpreted and, and, and mistaken to be the way that we get to heaven. We see that in the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right, where they, they acted as if what they did is what made them righteous. And that idea is done away with. If you just read the book of Hebrews. You'll understand, and, and, and believe me, I don't understand all the book of Hebrews. It's a very difficult book to understand. But, but some of these ideas seem to be very clear to me. But, but there's something here that even though the, the works, and I want you to hear me here, even though the works are not what save you, the value of it is still kept. It's still kept. Because there's something in Hebrews, look at Hebrews chapter 20 here. It's, it's it, our, the life that we live is called a new and living way. And I want you to look at that here with me. Look at verse 20. By a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Wait a minute. So he said there's a new and living way. So there's a new way of life. Is a new way to live this life. Is a new living way in Christ that he is now giving you everything that you need, the sustaining power of the Holy Spirit that invigorates us, that awakens us, that regenerates us. That is what we call the born-again experience to now live this life for Christ. This is the idea that's embedded inside of Job chapter 5 or 17, when we're told, happy is the man. Because even though we're suffering, even though often God has to chastise us, even though we're going through the agony of, of you know, six troubles, and then on the seventh one, even that one won't hurt you. This continual life of trouble that we live in, we can do it because we have been given now. We see this in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit. We have been given a new and living way. I have to remind you here, we're, we're still speaking of how to experience joy. So I want you to see the order here. Look at verse 20. 
New and living, verse 22, you draw near, okay? Draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, okay? So you're, you're drawing near in full assurance of faith. And then look at, look at verse 23, um, where it says, good deeds there. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, uh, excuse me, not, not verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So again, you have new, new life. Right, you have a drawing near now. You again, that goes back to Job chapter five, um, where it talks about the, you know, being fearless. Remember, we talked about that, where where you won't be afraid of the violence. You you come in bold before God in faith, bold before life to live your Christian life as a true believer in Christ, speaking the truth of the Word of God, no matter what your circumstances is, because you know. The backing that you've got. You know the Holy Spirit that is in you. And so it is in that, once we've recognized these things and we have this faith that we're told in verse 25 here, you know, where where we're saying in verse 24, excuse me, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now, th this is important. Okay. Look at here where. In verse, in verse um, 35 now, we're going to go there next. So just kind of keep your, your finger there. Look, but look at verse 25 first, because it says, not forsaking for our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the day drawing near. So we have this pattern, new life, faith, coming in faith and boldness, deeds. And then he says, well, that's a good pattern. How about we keep doing that? Remember, we're talking about how do you live in joy. When you remind yourself of these things, that's what's important. Okay, so then we have this kind of weird thing that happens here. Look at the end of, um, look at verse 26, actually, Hebrews 10, 26. I'm going somewhere with this, okay? So listen, listen close because I, I don't want you to miss this. Verse 26 says, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Well, what does that, what does that even mean? Well, look, go down to verse 35 where I told you to put your finger on. Look at verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. How do you throw away your confidence? By sinning. And then it says, which has a great reward. Well, how does the reward, the reward get there? Through the deeds. Okay, so we're, we're talking about two different things here. We know we have heaven. That's guaranteed to us. Okay. But we have this life to live. And this is a life that we live by faith and through faith. So Job's suffering if you think about it, when we go back to Job in chapters four and five, it's portrayed by Eliphaz as something that's part of life. Okay? Remember, he says that these are things, we learned this about two weeks ago, things that, that happen in life. They're part, the suffering is part of the process of life. And let's just go back there so, so I can show this to you specifically. Go back to chapter 5, chapter, verse 1. Call now, Job, call now, is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? Remember when we talked about that. It's this idea that there's nothing you could do, Job. Suffering is here. And it's, it's the old saying, right, when we say don't cry over spilled milk. Well, why? Because there's nothing you could do about it. So this is the idea that, that, that we're being told. And so why is that important? Why are we even talking about this in this way? Because if we don't pay attention to how we act as Christians, if we don't pay attention to our actions, if, if we don't observe our experiences that we're going through, we can easily fall into willful sin. We can easily throw away our confidence. All that God has given us, the faith that we have, the, the joy that he's given to the believer, we, we, because we're not willing to, to live a life for God the way that we should, 
And, and because we're not willing to observe our experiences under, under, the, under the, the light of the word of God that shows us that suffering is a conduit to knowing God, and, 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 and to grow in, in, in sanctification and all of these things that we've talked about. When you ignore those things, you tend to willfully sin. And the, the problem is that there's so many Christians that think that their willful sin is just a part of, oh, but that's just, I'm suffering. I can't, I can't get over this thing. I can't get over that. And so they think it, it's part of just, you know, this fallen nature, but it's not. Because what we're learning in, in Job chapter 5, for example, when he's talking about from six troubles, I will deliver you, it's not talking about six sins there. It's telling you that you're going to have troubles in life, that bad things may happen to you and certainly will happen to you. Maybe not as much as the next guy or maybe more than the next guy. And it's telling you, listen, you're going to go through all of that. but Keep trusting in me. Keep believing in me. Keep obeying me. That's what the Lord is saying here. That's what we need to get out of it. And so the reason that I, that I find Hebrews so interesting is because often when we forget that, we think that when the Bible says, you know, the righteous will fall seven times, we think that it's talking about falling in sin seven times. No, it's just telling you, listen, life will beat you up. You're going to fall by a beating, not because of the sin. And so that doesn't mean that we're, we're never going to sin, but there's this part of willful sinning. And, and I think when we don't recognize the massive work that God has done to save us, then we fall into that. This is the same problem that life is, is, is talking to Job about, but he's misapplying it. But when he's talking to him about anger and not accepting the chastisement of the Lord, the suffering in his life, say, look, you're going down the bad way here. You're going down the foolish route here, down, down the road of the unrighteous if you don't accept this. Well, we know that, that that wasn't the case with Job, but certainly we can apply that to our own lives. And, and that's what I was talking about earlier. It's the first thing that we want to pay attention to often, particularly when, when, when some of these friends are speaking here. Because there is some wisdom there. We don't just want to dismiss it as them being mean or something like that. So when we get to verse 38 in Hebrews here at the end of chapter 10, it says, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And some people here think, well, you see, you can't shrink back. You, you're, you're, it's your actions that get you to heaven. But that's not what that's saying. Look at verse 39. But we're not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving, preserving of the soul. What is it saying? Shrinks back to destruction. What is it saying? It's saying you will face calamity. You will face trouble in your life, but you're not going to be destroyed by it. See, this is, this is why suicide rates go up often. When, when people get so depressed, having everything in the world, having all the niceties that we have, they still get so depressed, so focused on, on what they don't have or, or focus on, on what they wish they had or they have no God in their life. They're so desperate that they take their own lives. You know, there, there was a study on, done on social media on young girls. I don't have the study here in front of me, but where it talked about there was an increase of, of, women, of young girls cutting themselves and, and committing suicide because, you know, they were being shamed on, on, on Facebook on Instagram, and, 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 that, and that's ridiculous, right, when you think about it, but it, it's real. The, the human heart, the human mind, the human body gets destroyed by the very experience of the world. This is why when we look at Genesis, there, there, there's something that happens when man sins. It says that he dies. And then we have chapters where, you know, verses and verses that go on talks about, and he died, and he died, and he died. It's this idea that death is around us, destruction is around us. But here we're promised that we're not the ones that will shrink back to destruction. No, we're going to have faith to the preserving of the soul. But I told you earlier that the works, even though they don't save us, the value is kept in them. 
the value of them is cat. So l- look at this with me. I think this is so interesting. Look at the works that's listed in chapter 11, okay? The triumphs of faith, uh, the hall of faith, as it is called. Look at everything that is listed here, okay, that, that people did. These are all the works. Abel, for example, offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. That's in chapter 11, verse 4. In verse 7, Noah prepared an ark. In verse 8, Abraham set out on a journey without knowing where he was going. In verse 9, Sarah had a baby. In verse 17, Abraham took his son Isaac up to be sacrificed. In verse 20, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. In verse 21, Jacob blessed the sons of Joseph. In verse 22, Joseph foresaw the exodus, gave order that his bones, right, when he was dead, were to be taken back to the promised land. In verse 23, Moses' parents hide him. That's an action that they took. These are all works, right? Moses, as an adult, refuses to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to be with his people, verse 24 and 26. Verse 27 and 28, Moses leaves Egypt, right? He keeps the Passover. Verse 29, all of Israel crosses the Red Sea. All these people just walking through. They're taking action. They're doing what, what they're being told to do. In verse 30, the walls of Jericho fell. Why? Because they took action. They were walking around it. Rahab welcomed spies, Right? There's another action in verse 31. Then it talks about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, uh, down in verse 32. And it says essentially, look, we don't have we don't have space to to talk about all the things that they did. But what it does is it attributes it not to human willpower, but faith. Why? Well, Hebrews eleven six tells us it is impossible to serve the Lord. It's impossible to please the Lord. Without faith. But you see that the work is not diminished. So how do you find joy? How do you find joy? Well, you find joy in knowing that everything that you do, the satisfaction is that all your actions are done in Christ and for Christ. That's the satisfaction we get as Christians. That's the joy that we have. Now, sometimes it's mundane, right? Man, who's had boring days? I've had boring days. And usually boring means that you're probably not doing what you should be doing, but we've all had them. Mundane, just the, how about the everyday thing? Just go to work, get back in the car, go to work, church, back in the car, go to work, same thing. Sometimes it's mundane, but we don't think about the strength God gives me, the breath he gives me, the energy he gives me. The resources that I get from working, now I have a home. I can feed my kids. You know, I could buy my wife something nice. You know, I, I, can, I can go on a vacation. I can do all of these things. So it's not just mundane. Now we really think about it. Well, we have joy. When we have satisfaction in experiencing things, when we suffer, we say, well, God, I'm suffering. I'm going through it. But I understand that you have something to teach me through this. You see, it's, it's, it, 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 it's this idea that we're given, again, back in, in, in Job, okay? He puts it even in a worse way, okay? He's, he's talking about famines, he's war, scourge of the tongue, afraid of the violence, violence, okay, wild beasts. You know, these are all things that were all meant to, 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 to basically kill you. God saves you from all that on a daily basis. Also that you can experience the joy of what it is to live under the providence of a God who cares about the world he made. Even after we've sinned and deserve nothing but the wrath of God. So that is to feel it, to experience every moment of your life. Right? Knowing that God will one day bring you to himself. That's part of it. And so I want you to understand that. I want you to think about your actions differently and your experiences differently. Because some of you, and I know some of you personally, are going through some horrific things right now. Some of you have, you know, sick family members. Some of you are sick yourself. Some of you are experiencing, you know, all kinds of difficulties in your life. Others might be rejoicing, but what I'm saying is, listen, 
every experience, every action you take, you have to pay attention to it. You have to know that as a believer, when we do something, we're doing it as a believer, as a Christian, and that, and that should mean something. It, it really should. And we should take these things seriously. Well, let me wrap up here. I hope this is making sense. You know, this might be one of those lessons that it makes more sense to me, and, and, and maybe God's just speaking to me. But, but I hope this is making sense. Here's the question that, that, that strikes me as well, because maybe some of you don't struggle so much with, you know, maybe it, it, it's true sometimes that your life might not be so harsh, you know, but every time that a hiccup does happen or, or something bad does happen, um, you know, the question in your, in your mind and your heart should be, am I really trusting God here? Am, am I really trusting the Lord? Am I putting my full confidence in God? Do we really trust in God? That's, that's the question I want to touch on here for the last few minutes. Well, first, there's endless suffering. We saw that in verse 19, right? One bit of suffering after another. One bad thing after another. That's our existence. It, it's, it's, let me compare it in this way. Because I really want you to get the gravity of this. Okay? Are you getting younger every day? No. You're getting older every day. Right? That's a bad thing. Why is that a bad thing? I'm talking, I'm talking strictly flesh here, body, okay, material things, not considering everything else we talked about. Why is that a bad thing? Well, because every day you're closer to death. You're dying every day. Okay? So even if everything else is going hunky-dory, everything's going great, you're dying every day, slowly. Oh, it don't feel like it. But man, it could get pretty morbid, right? If you really start thinking about it. Well, verse 19 in Job chapter 5 says, that's the reality. There will always be suffering. Now, it's endless, but it's not eternal. And that's important. And it demonstrates God's love. Why? Because we should be suffering in agony, in in torment. I mean, the Bible says that the unbeliever, the unrighteous person, when, when, when God's judgment finally comes upon the world, would be in, in, in utter darkness, would be cast out, out of the presence of God, in torment, day and night, nonstop. You know? It, it, it's this body that, that, that feels every sharp and dull and, and, and excruciating pain that you can possibly experience but, but doesn't die in, in the sense that it, it's just, it stays alive just enough for you to keep experiencing, experiencing this pain time and time again. That's what we have. But God has said, no, you know, for the believer, the extent of your suffering will be your life. This is it. Think about that. The extent of your suffering is this life. This is why you can't have your best life now. This is, this is why we look forward to the hope. The unbeliever doesn't have that. The unrighteous person doesn't have that. They're holding on to this life because that's all they see. <laughs> and there's some unbelievers that, that you know, know enough that they know they're on the way to hell. And they really don't want to let go of this life. Well, we also suffer to see God's wonderful wisdom at work. This is, this is the height of Job, right? Go to Job 42. This is something that we, we're not, we're not going to get there next week, but we'll, we'll get there eventually. But look at Job 42 and verse 3 and 4. It says, Who is that that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared... 
that which that I did not understand, things too wonderful for me. You see, where Job is heading, let me give you a sneak peek. Where Job is heading is, is that he only had heard of how good God was, of how wonderful God was. But then when God is speaking to him and reveals to him who he is, he says, oh, oh, I, when I was talking in chapter 3 and chapter 6, and when I was saying all these things that I was saying, oh, I didn't know it was this wonderful. I didn't know I had it this good. I didn't know you were that majestic. And that's Job, who's blameless before God. And so what I'm trying to get you to understand today is say, you know, I want to know more about God. And I can know God through good things that happen, bad things, through pain and through suffering and through joyous moments. I can utilize this entire life, the word of God, my experience in church and at work, and I can find God working providentially through all of these things. And boy, when you get to that point in your life, oh, God is wonderful. There's nothing that you cannot give him glory for. This is why our suffering is not pointless. Because God Providence is demonstrated in it. We see him in it. We learn more of him. We grow in sanctification. In this sense, suffering is only terrible for the flesh. But we live by faith. That is the idea that we're getting here. Now, you might think, Miss, this is, this is just you being you know, with your hyper-spirituality. No. This is the difference between knowing what it is to have bliss now and having bliss later. Between having, trying to have perfect happiness now in this fallen world or saying, no, no, I will live my every action. I will experience my every experience to the glory of Almighty God because Christ died on a cross for me and he has done everything that he has to do to secure my salvation and I will now live for the glory of God alone. That's not hyper-spirituality. I say recognition. That whatever he has for me there is better than what I can get for myself here. And so do we really trust God? Or do we really just want to help ourselves in order to get some temporary fleshly pleasure? When we go pray to God and we say, help me with my finances, is it because we want to take a vacation? Why do we ask God for the things that we ask him for? And if it's not so that he may glorify himself in whatever way it is that he wants to do, we have to ask these questions. When, when calamity strikes you, do you run to God? Do you say, God, what am I going to learn through this? Do you say, God, I trust you. I believe you. I know you got something through this. Oh, believe me, I know what it is to get bad news. I know what it is to have someone just die on you and you love and you all of a sudden they're gone. I've experienced that. Oh, I've experienced tragedy in my life, abuse in my life. I know what it is. I know what pain is. But do I run to God? Or do I find my sustenance in the world? Do I seek out pleasure in the world? And that is a sin. And the priority should be running to God. When calamity comes, all it should mean to us is time to be humbled before God. It's time to practice humility before God. So take the example of Christ seriously. You know, before Christ was on the cross, he, he pleads to God and he says, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. 
And then when he's on the cross, after he's carried this cross, and now he's on there, he pleads again, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Take the example of Christ seriously. When he's suffering there innocently, and he knows he's as innocent, but he looks out at the crowd and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, he bleeds out on the cross. He thinks about others. He looks at his mother and he says, Woman, behold your son. And to John, he says, Behold your mother. And then to another, he says, today, truly, I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. Oh, was he physically concerned? It seems only about one thing. He says, I'm thirsty. Perhaps so that his body could live a little longer. So that every one of our sins was taken upon his body. He didn't leave one minute sooner. But in all that, his trust in the Father did not falter. He says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So what we learn today is to take seriously what Christ has done on the cross and say, if he endured all that and he did it for me, I can find joy in my suffering. Joy in my pain. Joy in what God is doing. Whether I understand it or not. Whether I like it or not. And to trust that when all these things happen. The famine. The war. When all the calamity comes. That you can put your full trust in God. That's all the time I have for today. Let's pray. Father we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that people see you and they see Christ. That's what matters, Lord. Let your name be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we will see you guys next week. We really do appreciate it. If you want to subscribe, please go to mindofmiz.com forward slash subscribe. This has been the Mind of Miz podcast. <laughs>